Reason tells us what's normal. Normal's not anything to aspire to. We want to go past normal. I'm not saying we can all be the best in the world, but it's not about that. We can all be better than we are now. And that's the work. Are we willing to commit ourselves to do everything we can to be better than we are now? Hi, and welcome to part two of this study of Rick Rubin's new book, The Creative Act. Now, before we get going here, I really want to say a quick thanks to everyone who watched and enjoyed the first videos. Reading your stories, appreciation and support in the comments have given me a huge amount of pleasure and has 100% led to me taking on this further exploration of the book. Now in this second video, we'll be taking a look at one of the central motifs of Rick's text, where across a network of 8 or so chapters, he offers us a detailed look at how he builds a creative project from start to finish. When reading the creative act, this description really jumped out at me for use, because it's full of practical takeaways for creatives that I hope will resonate with this community. Now a quick note to say that, even though I've tried to cover a large amount in this video, there's still a load more in the book left to discover, so if you have the resource and are interested, I'd definitely recommend picking up a copy for your own creative space. Additionally, I've also created a document with some further takeaways and links in the process of making this video, so I'm writing a sister article with additional notes, which I'll be posting out this week on the Inside Creative Minds newsletter. Right, with all that said, I really hope you get some value from the piece today. This is Creative Minds, and thanks for watching. In collecting the material for the book and thinking about it, I would look back at why did I want to do that? And is there a, a principle at play that could be of use outside of this case? In this first section, we're going to look at Ruben's depiction of inspiration and how we as artists can set ourselves up to access our best ideas with some basic practical methods. Jumping into the text now, and we can see how Rick takes the creative muse very seriously, approaching his search for ideas and inspiration as a relationship with this unseen force. Talent, Rick writes, is the ability to let ideas manifest themselves through you. As creators, we're vehicles to allow creation to happen. Rarely, maybe never, does something come from inside of us. It may get re reformed within us, but it doesn't start within us. We are the sum total of our life's experiences, what we've learned, what we've seen, uh, the emotions that we've felt, the dreams that we've had. And that's the material from which everything we make comes. The planet is a productive planet. If you look outside, you see green. Nature is constantly growing and Man, as part of nature, is participating in this growth. Here, Rick describes our own ideas and point of view as emerging from deep inside of us, and the momentum or motivation to create as being an urge akin to the cycles of the natural world. Now, for some, these views may be verging too far into the spiritual realm, but whether we're comfortable there or not, most of us as children or adults have had that experience of drawing or playing an instrument where the line or melody is somehow leading our hand forwards and we as subjects are more akin to explorers than controllers of the action. And to look at this idea further, I want to pull up an interview with writer and director David Lynch, an artist who has steeped himself in the discussion of inspiration and his dialogue with the creative spirit. Well, ladies and gentlemen, life changed. We don't do anything without an idea. So they're beautiful gifts. And I always say you desiring an idea is like a bait on a hook. Yeah. It can pull them in. And if you catch an idea that you love, that's a beautiful, beautiful day. And you write that idea down so you won't forget it. And that idea that you caught might just be a fragment of the whole, whatever it is you're working on. But now you have even more bait thinking about that small fragment, that little fish, will bring in more. I like to think of it as in the other room, the puzzle is all together, but they keep flipping in just one piece at a time. Now personally, I find this description of how we find our creative ideas can actually be very freeing for the artistic process. As creators, we are not forced so much to will ideas or inspiration as to create the correct conditions for that process to occur. But with that responsibility in mind, how best then can we intentionally create those moments? Well, to better develop an answer to that question, 
Let's start with a quote from Pulitzer and Nobel Prize winning author, Toni Morrison. If writing is thinking and discovery and selection and order and meaning, Morrison writes, it is also awe and reverence and mystery and magic. Here she clearly defines the two sides of the creative process that we've been discussing, the unknowable side which the artist convenes with and the formal processes that we might lead ourselves. Now this tension between the freedom that we must allow for ideas and the practical structures that we must apply to access them is something I've encountered across many books and interviews about the creative process. On one hand the art relies on us being open and free thinking, whilst on the other it requires a kind of strict form maintaining habits and routines that enable us to access inspiration and execute on our ideas. Good habits create good art, Rick writes. Consider establishing a consistent framework around your creative process. It is often the case that the more set your personal regimen, the more freedom you have within that structure to express yourself. I would go down to my lovely little gazebo at the bottom of the garden, sit down and I'm absolutely allowed not to do anything. I'm allowed to sit at my desk, I'm allowed to stare out at the world, I'm allowed to do anything I like, as long as it isn't anything. I'm not allowed to do a crossword, not allowed to read a book, not allowed to phone a friend. All I'm allowed to do is absolutely nothing or write. And what I love about that is I'm giving myself permission to write or not write. But writing is actually more interesting than doing nothing after a while. You know, you sort of sit there and you've been staring out the window now for five minutes and it kind of loses its charm. <laughs> You're going, well, actually, might as well write something. Here we see Gaiman discussing his own experience with accessing inspiration through a close relationship between routine, environment, and engaging in the creative act. This is a common feature I've found across many creators I've looked at on this channel. Just as the artist is free and radical in their work, so they find themselves in strict relationships with the environments and routine that allow them to most successfully create. To go in the basement and, and, and do something that you love to do and, and to create something that's positive and something like that, that, that that's my only outlet, my only outlet, you know to go in the basement and, and do me, even if nobody even heard the stuff I did. You know, I think I would still go in the basement and, and mess around or DJ or just listen to music because I was, through my whole life, been the only thing to take me away from all of the crazy stuff that's going on. Trying to retain some of the warmth and energy from that clip, let's move on to the next stage of Rick's discussion, how to cultivate these seeds into something larger. So in the seed phase, there's no deadlines. It's just a wide open, Heart. And then the next phase, you start experimenting to see what the seeds want to do. You're involved, but you're more of a, um, you're not really dictating the action. You're, you're setting the stage for something to happen, but it's not about you yet. So it'd be like the equivalent of you'd plant the seed, you would water it, you would make sure it was in the sun, and you'd wait. Um, so you're involved, but you, you can't make it grow. Now, as with phase one, we can see that Rick's depiction of cultivating our ideas is underpinned by a relinquishing of our own power. Now, as creators, we're here to set the scene and nourish the ideas, not to try and control or manipulate them. As the seeds arrive, Rick writes, forming conclusions about their value or fate can get in the way of their natural potential. In this phase, the artist's work is to collect seeds, plant them, water them with attention, and see if they take root. Now, I've covered a fairly developed discussion of these themes in the Frank Ocean video, which I'll link at the end, but Rick reiterates this concept and provides us with some practical tips for engaging with this process. It starts with this, again, coming in blank, like um, not having any preconceived ideas, being open, and really listening, trying our best to do that without any of the beliefs that we might have to impact what that is and want to be as neutral as possible. My goal is, is, is not to form an opinion, it's to understand. So if anything, just ask questions. So just as Rick creates that open and unjudgmental dialogue as a producer, so we can look to achieve this in our internal discussions with our ideas. Again, we are looking to be led here by whatever is coming up. 
and allowing that seed of inspiration to change our plans, taking us into surprising or unknown territory if it wants to. The work reveals itself as you go, Rick writes. Sometimes the purpose of a seed is to propel us in a completely new direction. Along the way, it may morph into something hardly resembling its original form and become our finest work yet. Now to develop this method of approach further, I want to bring in two short clips from other artists discussing the mindset of creation at this stage. And to kick us off, let's take a look at another one who left us way too early, jazz singer-songwriter Amy Winehouse. I mean, when I sit down to write a song, I don't think this will be good. I don't think this sounds a bit like that. I should work that in and make that sound like that. And I don't think I should have that particular line in it. Like, I just sit down and just let it come out, you know what I mean? And that's what you have to do. You have to let a song grow. You can't push a song out and you can't force it to be anything when it's out. You've just got to let it grow. Here we recognise the open and unjudgmental attitude that can lead to transformative work. Now to set the scene for this approach, we can try to cultivate a kind of naive and curious spirit in our practice, reflected in the following words from soundtrack extraordinaire, Hans Zimmer. Because I had a sort of a vision and a sound in my head. My challenge was not being a grown-up, not trying to be the man who's done a lot of movies, but to regress in a way and become the reckless 13-year-old teenager and write as a 13-year-old teenager. Now I want to make another quick note just to shout out Rick here and say that although we're getting through a great deal of content here, there really is loads more to be discovered in the book. As a side note to that, if you are enjoying this video, please consider dropping a like down below to support the growth of this channel. And make sure you subscribe for loads more videos like this in the future. Right, enough meanderings there. Let's get back to what we came here for and jump into the book now to introduce Rick's take on section three, the crafting phase. Once the seed's code has been cracked, Rick writes, and its true form deciphered, the process shifts. We are no longer in the unbounded mode of discovery. A clear sense of direction has arisen. Now comes the labour of building. The lines have been drawn. Now we're filling in the colours. When it sprouts and it grows, and, or if it turns into a plant, then you can look at the plants like, OK, how does this plant, what's the potential of this plant? And then, you, and then that the third phase is the crafting phase, where it's like, OK, I have this plant. Maybe I'm going to trim it, or maybe I'm going to uh, combine it with these other plants to make some something else with it. Now it's like material that you have. At this stage, our projects have gathered a more solid form. And as artists, the crafting phase is where we apply our skills of making and begin to actually realize the ideas into being. For many of us, this stage will represent the longest period of our project. What we want to build is becoming visible to us now, but still we have to allow it to morph and develop inside of our practice. You can get the idea for a, a novel in quite a short period of time, but then you have to sit down and work at it. And while you're working it out, you often get um, more and different and new ideas. And that can be a long process. It can take, you know, a year, two years um, to work out an idea that you might have had in five minutes. As Atwood describes, in the crafting phase, we are spending a lot of time with the work at hand, and it is only natural that possible changes and developments will be suggested to us as ideas are tested and the process moves forwards. Testing of every idea is really important, and that's how you get to see, oh, that's not at all what I thought it was going to be. It happens to me all the time. I, I know because someone will suggest, why don't we do it like this? And I'll think, that sounds bad. Mm -hmm. And then I'll think, okay, let's try it. And then we hear it. And then, you know, eight times out of 10, it's nothing like I imagined and great. Both in this clip and in the text, Rick reminds us of the importance of building conceptual ideas into real, consumable things before deciding whether to follow that pathway further or not. Again, we are pointed to the importance of remaining open to discovery through this process, keeping the project flexible enough to shift around and incorporate new ideas. When I'm with you, you make me blue. When I'm with you, baby girl, I'm blue. Oh, baby girl, I'm blue. Baby girl, I'm blue. And you're okay 
with the blue going on the one, even if you want to Now to finish this exploration of the crafting process, I want to jump back into the words of Hans Zimmer, watching as he pulls together the seed ideas of a soundtrack and engages in the massive crafting exercise required for a fully orchestrated Hollywood movie score. So I had this framework of exotic synthesized or built instruments. I remember saying to Tina Guo, my cellist, I, I want your cello to sound like a Tibetan war horn. PVC is your friend, PVC piping. I actually made a subcontra bass duduk by putting this into a very long tube of PVC. I do things that not many people in the world can do. But then I told him, yes, yeah, I can do this. He said, can you do air? I said, yeah, I can do. But can you make vowels while you're doing the air in a flute? And go like, no, don't do this to me. And he's. Okay, let's jump into the final stage now, where Rick leads us through a few ideas on how to finish the work and close out the project. As the work improves through the craft phase, Rick writes, you'll come to the point where all the options available to you have been explored sufficiently. The seed has achieved its full expression and you've pruned it to your satisfaction. Nothing is left to add or take away. The work's essence rings clear. Now there's a heap of information that Rick looks at in the book around finishing, but for now I want to pull out two practical tips that I found in this section, starting with his take on mapping out timelines and committing to a project deadline. I've come to realize that by the time you're going into the completion phase, you can have a deadline and it won't hurt the project. In fact, it might help the project. And I didn't know that before. So I've worked on projects that have gone longer than they necessarily needed to and maybe not in the best interest of the project because I didn't know that. I didn't understand that, that the timing of that because I, because I am so aware of the necessity in the experimental phase to not have a deadline that I assumed that that held through the whole project. So Rick has come around to the use of deadlines in this final stage. And as an artist, once the end is in sight and all the creative aspects of the work have been realized, we could probably all do with a finish line and a realistic countdown clock to get us across it. But as well as the helpful addition of time constraints at this finishing stage, Rick points out another practical lesson for artists and a reason why so many of them struggle to finish and deliver. When you believe the work before you is the single piece that will forever define you, it's difficult to let it go. The urge for perfection is overwhelming. It's too much. We are frozen and sometimes end up convincing ourselves that discarding the entire work is the only way to move forward. Now I wonder if that sentiment feels familiar with you like it does with me. And this idea Rick is expressing sits within the headline topic of toxic perfectionism. And to protect herself from this force, Rick suggests that in the final stage of a project, we grow a healthy level of disregard for the work or what we should expect to feel as we release it into the world. The real creative work is now behind us and we should begin to detach ourselves and leave the power of those ideas in the past. Everything is like a, a um, it's almost like a diary entry. Everything we make is a, is a reflection of a moment in time, a window in time, could be a day, it could be a year, it could be a, you know, it could be whatever window you decide that it is. And you know, if you're not interested in working it on it anymore, it's done. Now you may decide it's not good enough to share with people and that's fine. But if it's good enough to share with people, there's no regret looking back. In service of growing that healthy perspective around control and audience reaction, Rick suggests the closing period of a project as a great moment to start looking beyond it and building something new and shiny to get excited about. The final phase is a fertile time to plant a new crop of seeds, Rick writes. The excitement of what's coming can generate the vital energy needed to bring the current work to its close. We can't wait to finish because there's another idea calling that lights us up. Again, this approach helps the artist build the momentum they need to remove any painful goodbyes and carry on with what really matters, the process of continuing to make things and retaining a joy in doing the things they love. The things that end up breaking through don't break through in the way we thought or turn out to be a third iteration of something that we thought was an entirely different thing or 
we don't know, you know, it's, and I, I think it's, if we embrace that not knowing, we'll have a healthier experience going through life. Okay, as for a description of Rick's phases, I hope I've done a decent job. And if you've read the book yourself, let me know if I missed anything that jumped out at you from the text. Now we've got to the end of Rick's description, I wanted to put forth a couple of overarching thoughts that I had on his ideas. It seems that overall, what Rick offers us with these phases is a slow and not necessarily linear movement from the completely open process of ideas catching to the closed off one of deadlines and final completion. The wide mouth of our process opens up to receive inspiration at its top and slowly closes stage by stage, distilling the ideas and allowing us to communicate their truest essence to our audience. At many moments in the process, we are there to simply facilitate and turn up for the work. And at the end of the day, whatever we intended for the piece to come across as, its real effect will only be built and felt through its reconstruction within the audience's mind. I think when the person wrote them, they may have had one interpretation, um, but it's not contingent on us getting that interpretation to like it or resonate with it or feel it. In some ways, the best uh, the best art is open enough where the artist gets to have their experience when they make it and then the audience gets to have their experience when they listen and they don't have to be the same. Okay, before you go, I wanted to say a huge thanks to the community artists who have helped soundtrack this piece and remind you that you can find links to all their work in the description below. Please do go and check out Rick's book if you fancy reading everything it has to offer. And again, for further discussion, check out the Inside Creative Minds newsletter that I've linked in the comments. It's completely free, and I'll be dropping my additional notes post there sometime later on this week. Right, with all that said, love to the community in here for watching. Love to Rick for facilitating all this great discussion, and peace in whatever you're working on this week. <laughs>